You can buy specialty tools to clean suede, but some household items will do the trick just the same. Remove loose dirt with a dry microfiber cloth. Microfiber is great because it doesn't leave behind any lint. Next, you'll need a small brush with firm bristles. You'll want to brush in one direction. This will remove dirt and brush out those fibers. Now you can use an eraser, yep, just a regular old school eraser. Gently rub on areas where you have tough stains and marks. And if that eraser is not quite doing the job, you can try a nail file. Just lightly file back and forth to bring that suede back to life. Look at that, you can clearly see the difference. Of course you clean your coffee pot, but when's the last time you cleaned the coffee maker? These things are super handy to clean way more than just dentures. Fill the water tank up and then add one or two tablets. Then let those completely dissolve. Denture tablets are gonna be great to remove bacteria from the inside of your coffee machine and descale. This works on all coffee machines, traditional and single serve. Then run your coffee maker like normal. Without coffee, of course. Run the machine with the denture tablets until the reservoir is empty. Then fill the tank up with clean water, run it again to rinse everything out. Once the water runs clear, you're ready for a fresh brew. You can also use these for hard to clean water bottles. And water packs like these. Fill that up with water and let this sit for 15 minutes. And use a tablet to keep your toothbrush clean too. You should still be replacing your toothbrush regularly, but this will help keep it clean in between. The trick to fluffy pancakes is all about the eggs. You're gonna separate the egg yolk and that egg white. Add milk and some melted butter. Then with these, we want super whipped up fluffy egg whites that we're gonna fold in at the end. You can do this by hand, but I prefer power tools. Just whip up those egg whites till they're soft and fluffy. I'm gonna mix everything together. Don't over mix, pancake batter should be lumpy. Finally, those fluffy egg whites. Just fold it in. I like to do this trick, just unwrap half of it and butter up your pan. From scratch, our box mix, just whip up those egg whites for the best pancakes. For a tough mess like this, a standard sponge is not gonna be enough to cut it. But this isn't a problem, I'm gonna show you the secret tool. Aluminum foil. You just need to ball this up and use it as a scrubber. This stuff will be abrasive enough for those stuck on messes. Just scrub lightly and all that should come right up. And this works especially well for cleaning cast iron. And for a grill pan, it'll form to those grates. Foil can also do the job cleaning up those barbecue grills. Don't use this trick on non-stick or enamel pans. Metal, of course, can ruin the coating on these types of pans. Foam soap is just water and soap aerated with a pump to last longer. So you can refill a bottle yourself once it's empty or treat yourself to a fancy reusable bottle. Besides, you'll be saving so much money anyways. You'll need three or four tablespoons of your favorite soap. I prefer to use a more natural soap like a steel, but you can also use any regular hand soap refill. Now fill the rest of the bottle up with clean water. One pump will do, 20 seconds. Here's how to wrap a present without tape. First, we need to measure out our paper, so put the box against the edge. Rotate the box three times. One, two, three. Give yourself a few inches excess and make your cut. Fold a square out of the paper. Now make another cut just with a little excess. Look at that, a square. Set your box upside down and add an angle. Pull up the paper till it covers the opposite edge and meets up with both corners. Once you have that measured out, you can lay this side down. I'm gonna take the opposite corner of the paper and pull that up. Now I don't have tape, so just hold this in place. It helps to draw a crease on the inside edge straight up. This will be the line that meets the outside edge of our box. Now you can set that crease. And just hold all that in place. Now for the next side, same thing. Draw a crease, pull up the side to meet the edge. Now hold that side in place. Just make sure everything's tight and all your corners are secured. Right here, we've made a nice little pocket. On our last side, I'm gonna make my creases. Tuck in these sides, pull the paper up and over. Now just tuck the flap into the little pocket and crease it to seal. No tape needed and we've got a wrapped gift. Here's how you make your own gel ice packs. Let's start off with a reusable zip top bag. They're more sustainable. Add two parts water, one part alcohol, a little bit of dish soap. And for the right look, food color. Now, get as much air out as you can. Just make sure that's sealed tight or you can double bag it. Now this goes into the freezer for a few hours or overnight. A non-toxic alternative is to make a gel pack with light corn syrup. 
This is a safe option for kids because if it does leak, it's just sticky. For lunches, freeze some wet sponges. If they thaw, they won't leak. After some time in the freezer, we have our gel ice packs. If you want it a little more firm, just add less alcohol. I definitely recommend keeping an ice pack like this on hand for injury and fatigue, and non-toxic packs like these are great for lunches. Don't let your grill turn your burgers into this. Form your hamburger patties ahead of time, and let those chill in the fridge at least 30 minutes. That'll help them cook more evenly and keep them juicy. Before they're ready to hit the grill, brush them with a high heat oil. I like to use grapeseed oil. Then add salt, pepper, and your favorite seasonings. Since burgers are prone to flare-ups, preheat your grill to get those grates nice and hot. Then you can turn a section off so there's no direct flame. And that's where you wanna put your burgers. Without a direct flame, you won't get those flare-ups. You can even add an ice cube to the center to help even out the cook. Now you can close up the grill and let those cook. Let your burgers cook halfway through and flip them one time. A good sign that your burgers are done is when those juices run clear. You can see there's still a little red in the juice there. This is a great time to add cheese right before those burgers are finished. To trap that juice inside, let them rest at least 10 minutes before eating. Now that's a tasty burger. To super chill your cooler, all you'll need is salt. I'm gonna check the temperature before I add the salt to see if it makes a difference. Now that's cold. Now add the salt. Use a coarse salt, or better yet, ice cream salt. You don't need much, just a generous sprinkle over the top. Now get in there and mix it up. Now that the drinks are in there, just let them get extra frosty. Oh yeah, it's much colder. All it took was a little science to get these drinks extra cold. Hot dogs are a grilling staple, but on these grates, they're so unruly. Get back here. All you need are skewers. Now you wanna make sure you soak your skewers at least 30 minutes before you put them on the grill. That'll prevent them from burning. Space your dogs out a little bit, and we're gonna run the skewer right through. And for this, you can do as many dogs as you want. Just lay them down and get grilling. No more rolling and all your dogs are together. We can also use a skewer to spiral cut our hot dogs. The trick is getting it right down the middle. You're gonna take a knife, slowly rotate it around the hot dog. Pull it through, we've got our spiral dog. I like this because it's not only fun, but it'll help your dogs cook a little more evenly. The best part of the skewer method is that it makes the flip really easy. Skewer some veggie kebabs or mix it up, make some grilled pineapple. It's best to grill over a medium heat, that way everything cooks through and doesn't burn. Here's how to make the best lemonade at home. The secret is all in the lemon peel. Just use a vegetable peeler and get that peel right off. All those oils in the peel will give you an incredible burst of lemon flavor. Try to mostly get the peel, but if there's a little bit of the pith, that's okay. Now add sugar to the lemon peels. Mix it up and that sugar will absorb all those lemon oils. Let this sit for a few hours or overnight. This is what our lemons look like after they've sat. I'm gonna add this to a small saucepan. Add some water and let this dissolve over medium heat. Roll your lemons to get them extra juicy. Six to eight lemons should be enough. Squeeze and juice. Once that sugar's dissolved, we're just gonna strain it and let it cool. Let's assemble our lemonade, starting with some filtered water. And the best part is you can do this to taste. You can make it more lemony or more sweet or you can infuse your lemonade with strawberries or herbs like mint and basil. This is the no hassle method to get your blender clean. You just need some warm water, fill it up halfway. You don't even need to rinse it first. Click that blender back in place and add some dish soap. Then let it blend. Pop it open and pour it all out. Everything just needs a rinse. No need to scrub those blades. That's as simple as blend and rinse. If your oven looks like this, you're due for a deep clean. While self-cleaning is an option, it can heat up your house, create smoke, and take a really long time. I'm gonna share with you an easy, chemical-free way to clean your oven. Remove the grates, and we'll get back to these later. To start, you're gonna wanna wipe down or vacuum out any large particles from the oven. And while you're at it, remove that bottom drawer and vacuum underneath. I'm sure it's disgusting. Now to actually clean the oven, we'll just start with some baking soda. Add some water a little at a time to form a thick paste. Just gonna rub this mixture all over the oven, especially anywhere where there's those dark spots. Be sure to avoid getting the mixture on the coils. And don't forget to clean the door. Let this mixture sit and work its magic for a few hours or up to overnight. While the oven's doing its thing, you can clean the grates. And if your sink's not big enough, you can consider letting these soak in a bathtub with soapy water. After that baking soda is set, Time to just wipe it all out. I'm gonna finish up with a solution of white distilled vinegar and distilled water. Spray it down. Fresh, clean oven, just with baking soda and vinegar. Here's how to quickly cool off your car interior. 
Start with rolling down that passenger window. Once it's rolled down, fan the driver's side door. Just fan the door about eight to 10 times. That'll push all that hot air out of the car. And if you're really in a hurry, you can try this method. Simply roll down all your windows and start driving. The only downside is your seat may still be a little hot. There's a few things you can do to prevent the interior car from getting too hot in the first place. After you park, turn your wheel upside down. That'll keep the top part in the shade. If you can, also crack your windows about an inch. Keep a large towel in your car to cover your seats, console, and dash. Believe it or not, the air outside is going to be cooler than the air inside. And with these tips, now we're ready to drive. Pickling is the perfect way to preserve produce. For canning these pickles, I need to start with sterilized jars. Just a little boiling water is all it takes. For pickles, we need brine, and that starts with hot water. And vinegar for that tang. And I recommend canning and pickling salt. I like to enhance the flavor with garlic and turmeric, but you can add any flavors you like. I'm gonna turn these into spears so they'll fit in my jars. And it's best to use fresh cucumbers to start off with. You'll get a crispier pickle in the end. At the base of the jar, you can add any whole spices you like. I'm adding coriander seeds, peppercorns, and mustard seeds. I love spice, so I'm gonna add a little red chili flake. Well, a lot of red chili flake. You want these jam-packed tight, and I like to add fresh herbs. Now I'm gonna ladle in the brine. Now to get these jars sealed and sterilized, I'm gonna lower these into some simmering water, making sure they're nice and submerged. And having a canning lifter makes this job a breeze. I'm gonna cover the pot and bring this to a boil. Leave these undisturbed for 24 hours. No more pop, now that's a nice seal. This turkey is rock solid. And you should never cook a frozen bird. Here's a faster method that takes hours, not days. To start, I'm gonna use a large pot and keep the turkey in its packaging. Now just fill the pot with cool water until it's completely submerged. If your turkey floats, you wanna make sure to weigh it down. I'm just using a can and a baking dish. If you don't have a pot big enough, you can do this right in the sink. Or you can use a cooler. Just make sure to disinfect it afterwards. Change the water every 30 minutes. This will help speed up the process. To completely defrost a frozen turkey, it's gonna take about 30 minutes per pound. And that's a heck of a lot quicker than the fridge method. And that's all it takes out of the pot, just drying it off, and we have a nice soft turkey ready to go. Now just keep it in the refrigerator until you're ready to roast. Roasting a whole turkey takes forever. But I'm gonna show you a cooking method that cut your cooking time in half. I need to put the turkey on my cutting board, breast side down. Carefully cut the backbone out of the turkey. For this, you need a really good pair of kitchen shears. Now I'm gonna remove the backbone completely and cut down the other side. And that's step one, removing the backbone. Now flip the turkey over. Now you need to apply a lot of pressure to the breastbone so it snaps and lays flat. I have a baking sheet with a baking rack. My turkey needs to go right on there. Make sure to leave your turkey out at room temperature for at least an hour before roasting. Gonna brush the skin with a little bit of oil. This turkey's already been seasoned and dry brined, so it's ready for the oven. Because that turkey's laying flat, it'll cook a lot faster and more evenly. It's a good idea to rotate and tent the turkey for even browning. You know what's done when the thigh meat reads 180 and the breast meat hits 170. And that's how you roast a turkey in half the time. Homemade chicken broth is as simple as bones and water. But broth alone is a little basic, so we're gonna add some delicious aromatics. Carrots, celery, onion, garlic halves, and a bundle of fresh herbs. Now just fill the pot with filtered cool water. Just enough to cover everything. Just bring this to a low simmer. Once that's simmering, add a splash of apple cider vinegar. Just a capful will help pull that flavor from those bones. Let this go for at least an hour, but the longer you let it sit, the better the flavor. We really just need the liquid, so we're gonna ladle everything through a colander. You can season this with salt to taste, but you can use this for any recipe you like. For a cold evening like this, I'm gonna make some warming chicken soup. I have some olive oil in the same pot, and I'm gonna add garlic, celery, carrots, and onion. A little salt on our veggies. A few cracks of pepper. Saute until these soften slightly. And I didn't forget the homemade chicken broth. Once those veggies are cooked through, I'm gonna add some leftover rotisserie chicken meat. Hmm, what a wonderful winter meal. Here's the right way to wrap a gift. Because wrapping paper tends to curl up, I like to roll it out the other way. To get the right size, put your box at the edge of the paper. Now rotate it three times. One, two, three. Now make your cut a few inches away from your box. 
Now measure for the sides of your box. You want the paper to come up three quarters of the way. And the same for the other side. I have two-sided paper, so I'm gonna pick this side. Place your box upside down on your paper. For one edge of the paper, fold it up with about an inch overlap. And you can tape that in place. Push the box into the paper to make sure it's nice and snug. For the other side, fold the paper under until it meets the edge on the other side. Then make a clean crease. Now tape that edge down. That looks great already, but we're not done yet. We've gotta do the ends. Fold in a nice clean triangle at the corner. A good clean crease is gonna be your friend here. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other corner. Now it helps to flip the box over. I'm gonna tuck in and crease this corner. Fold in and tape both sides. Now do the same thing on the other side. Now you know the right way to wrap a gift. Here's how to elevate basic ramen into a more complete meal. First, let's boil some noodles. Don't overcook your noodles. Ramen should have a little bit of chew. Drain these, add those to our bowl because the rest is gonna come together so quick. I stash these steaks in the freezer for about 15 minutes just to get them firm. This makes cutting thin slices easier. Salt, pepper, baking soda to tenderize, cornstarch to seal in juices. Mix this all up so it's evenly coated. Just need a little touch of oil in the bottom. Now we can saute our beef. Once that beef is no longer pink, I can add it to my noodles. For the rest of this recipe, I'm gonna add in bell pepper and onion. Saute that for 30 seconds. Now I can add my water. While this comes up to a boil, let's season it. We're not gonna use the whole flavor packet, just a little bit. We're gonna enhance our soup broth with our own flavors, like soy sauce. And my secret is mushroom powder, which adds a depth of flavor without adding salt. This is boiling, now it's time to add my broccoli and mushrooms. Look at all these wholesome ingredients, and we even have our green veggies. Top that with a little sesame oil and some green onion. Now that's a perfect cozy meal. A can opener is a common kitchen tool, but have you tried using it on its side? This would be the traditional way to open a can, but you can also place that blade on the side. Just like that. And just crank away. The lid's easy to remove and doesn't fall in. If you want, you can also strain the liquid first. Make one cut into the can and a smaller cut on the other side. Strain that liquid. Woo! Now flip to the side to take that lid off. Ta-da! If you have some extra coffee, go ahead and freeze it. Just use a simple old ice cube tray. Now this isn't gonna go to waste. Now these are just gonna firm up in the freezer. Now I can enjoy my iced coffee without diluting the flavor. Or use the cubes with your favorite milk or creamer. As those cubes melt, you'll get all that delicious coffee flavor. Phone, wallets, keys, so many things fall between those cracks in the seats. And depending on your vehicle, getting anything out can be the worst. The solution? A foam noodle. Just like the colorful pool kind, these are pipe insulation. You can find these at hardware stores and they're so cheap. And you can find them in different sizes. Just cut to fit and install this to fill that gap between the seats. I love this, it's so discreet, you don't even notice it's there. Look, now there's nowhere for anything to fall. Here's the right way to open a bottle of wine. With a firm grip, just twist that seal and pull off. For this style of wine opener, position the corkscrew right in the center of the cork. Now keeping everything straight, just twist straight down. And these arms give you the leverage you need to pull straight up. Gently pull and rock, just like that. But the traditional tool is a wine key or a waiter's corkscrew. If you do need to cut that foil seal off, just be sure to do it below the top lip. This just ensures that the wine never touches the seal. Firmly grip the bottle and place that corkscrew in the center of the cork. Keeping it straight, just twist down. Stop just before the end of the corkscrew. Now tilt the wine key and position the opener. Now gently begin to lift that cork. Partially pull up the cork and reposition the wine key. Many wine keys have two stages of opening, so pull that cork up. Now to fully remove that cork, just gently rock and twist. The problem with these little things is they can push earwax deeper into your ear. So what is the right way to clean your ears? Plot twist, for most people, you don't even need to clean inside your ears at all. Earwax is naturally regulating, so there should be no need to clean inside your ear canal. All that you really need is a damp washcloth and just gently clean around the surface of your ear. You can find many different types of ear cleaning tools, but these are only meant for the entrance of the ear and not deep inside. Earwax removal drops are also an option, just be sure to use as directed. Another option is lavage or syringe, which are specifically designed to safely flush earwax. 
While these tools do work, your safest option is going to be scheduling an annual cleaning with your doctor. Here's the right way to wrap a burrito. I'm going to ditch this for now and do a burrito the right way. To make a restaurant style burrito, you're going to want a larger tortilla at least 12 inches. Most important before you get filling and rolling is warm your tortilla. You can do this directly over a burner, in a dry skillet, or even a few seconds in the microwave. This makes the tortilla more pliable and less brittle. No matter what your favorite fillings are, make sure you have them all ready to make assembly easier. Muy importante, you want to make sure all those ingredients are evenly distributed. For sour cream and guacamole, I like to do a smear of it on so it's all spread out. You want to make sure you have a decent border of tortilla around your fillings. That way you make sure everything fits. I like to tuck everything back into the half of the burrito. I'm going to pick up those sides, flatten it out, pick up the back, tuck everything in, tuck in these corners, and roll her up. Bonus points, toast the bottom of that burrito in a dry skillet. It'll keep it sealed and it'll add extra texture. Nice and toasty. Here's how to unclog a toilet when you don't have a plunger. If there's no plunger, at least hopefully there's some rubber gloves, protect your hands, and also prevent any splashing. You don't want any of that water going in your mouth or in your eyes. If the bowl is overflowing, use a cup, one you don't care about, to remove as much water as you can. First, try hot water, not boiling. If it's too hot, you may crack the tank of the toilet. With the water level low, pour this in. The heat of that water should help loosen things up. If hot water alone is not doing the trick, add some dish soap. A generous amount of dish soap can help lubricate the clog and the degreasing properties can help break things up. Both of those should be a good solution, but if you have a more extreme problem, I've got one more thing for you. Now this one may seem wacky, but if you're somewhere residential, plastic wrap. This may take a few sheets, but cover the top of the toilet with the wrap. You're looking for an airtight seal. This will create the suction you need, just like a plunger to loosen up that clog. Unconventional, but hey, if it works, it works. Here's how you should be using a tape measure. Not every tape measure is created equal, so pay attention to the different markings and make sure you have one that works for your purposes. I like that this shows the fractions. That makes it a lot easier to read. It's helpful that this one has very large, very clear foot measurements. This is probably one of the most helpful features, the nail notch. This helps secure the tape at the end of a nail head. A push pin and a wall also helps. It's not easy to get an accurate measurement with a bend in the tape. The right way is to make sure that measuring tape is flush up against the corner. Tape measures will have their length listed. Just add that to your measurement. This is a contractor secret that I love. When you're making a mark, do it with a V or a carrot. That way you'll know precisely where to put that nail or screw. Two points can give you the cleanest cut and make sure to always use a pencil in case you mess up. And a little post-it note can help you quickly jot down your measurements. What's really easy for me is just to have a notes app open and use dictation. Length, four feet, seven inches. Because they do say measure twice and maybe measure again, just in case. This faucet has been giving me some trouble for a while. The buttons have been sticking because of all the hard water buildup inside. To fix this, I've had to develop a patent pending formula. It's just, white vinegar. To save on waste, I'm using a reusable zip top bag. Just gonna get this rubber band up around here first. Pour the vinegar in the bag just about halfway up and get that rubber band secured around the top. Once everything's secured, just add a little water until everything's covered. This method also works great on shower heads. I've let this sit on the faucet for a few hours. Let's take it off and see the results. That vinegar did its job breaking up that buildup. I'm just gonna wipe it down with a sponge to get rid of everything else. Use the rest of this vinegar and a sponge. Wipe around your sink to give everything a quick clean. I'm gonna show you how to make healthy homemade pita chips with only three ingredients. All you need is some pita bread, some extra virgin olive oil, and some sea salt. First, let's preheat the oven to 375 degrees. I like to use the traditional thin pita, but you can also use the thicker ones as well. Let's start by cutting the pita into thick strips. I like to grab my kitchen scissors and cut my pita into even squares. Next, we're going to add the olive oil. I like to do one tablespoon of olive oil for every loaf of pita. Now let's mix it until the pita is evenly coated. And as you're mixing, sprinkle in some sea salt. Let's line our baking sheet with parchment paper. Next, spread out the pita chips so they can cook evenly. Stick these in the oven for 10 to 15 minutes or until the chips are lightly golden. 
Toss them halfway through so both sides get toasted evenly. Pull them out of the oven and let them sit for about five minutes so they can get super crispy. These are so delicious with homemade hummus. Here's how to make your ice last longer. The first thing when you go pick up your ice, bring your cooler with you, the ice can go right in there. If you can, buy both chipped ice and block ice. Block ice will melt slower, which will keep your cooler colder longer. You also want cubed ice to wrap around all those beverages. I like to start with blocks of ice along the bottom. If you can't find blocks of ice, you can make your own in a large container. Larger blocks can take several days to freeze, so plan ahead. Freezing gallon jugs is another great alternative. They're mess free and you can drink the water when they're thawed. This can go right in your cooler and it's great for items that you wanna keep dry. Next, you can add your drinks. It's a good idea to pre-chill those drinks in the fridge so everything starts cold. Make sure to mix up the flavors so you can always access what you want. Layer in your loose ice just like lasagna. Ice and drinks, ice and drinks. Fill your cooler all the way up to the top. That'll minimize airflow. When it comes to ice in coolers, always buy more than you think you'll need. Here's what to do if your phone takes a dive. The best solution is to avoid the problem altogether. Use a protective case the next time you're near water. And it helps to find a case that floats. But if you do have an accident, once you've recovered your phone from the water, immediately power it down. After it's off, take it out of the case if it's in one. A little wax on, wax off to get it dry. If the phone's been submerged for long, you wanna tap on where the ports are to get any excess water to drip out. If you're able, take out SIM cards and batteries if they're removable. You may know that common trick of using rice to dry out your phone, but actually it's not that effective. The real hero is those silica gel packets. Yep, the same ones you're throwing away when you buy stuff from Target. So next time you get one of these in a package, save it for later. Or if you need extra, you can just buy them online. They're really cheap. You'll need an airtight container that fits your phone. Add the packets, seal it up. This is also great for key fobs and other small electronics. Let this sit for 24 hours, better yet, 48 hours. If it powers back on and seems to be functioning properly, you're good to go. But if it won't turn on or you notice any issues, power it down and take it to a repair shop. And you don't have to throw these away, you can reuse them. I'm gonna show you some trash bag secrets. Now it'll work either way, but your trash bags actually come inside out. This seam should be on the inside. We're gonna grab our trash bag and fit it around the rim like a hat. Gently push down, and now you'll notice that the seam is on the inside. And since we're talking about garbage, it's hard not to talk about the gross odors. Now, if you don't wanna get scented bags, you can always place a dryer sheet at the bottom of your trash can before you put your bag in. I like to throw away any scraps from dinner or any rotting fruit in a bag and throw it in my trash bin so it doesn't linger in my kitchen. Lastly, you should clean the inside of your trash can every two weeks to keep things clean and fresh. I'm gonna spread a little peanut butter into the center of both sides. A little peanut butter on both sides will prevent the jelly from making the bread soggy. Dot, dot, not a lot. You don't wanna overfill. Sandwich. Now for the fun, you just need a glass or a cup. And press down. The cup should seal the edges, but you can always give it an extra crimp. Use a fork and gently press around the edges. Don't let this go to waste. Make breadcrumbs or even croutons. You can use any alternative spread like almond or sun butter. You can even make fun versions with marshmallow fluff or thinly sliced bananas. You can make these ahead of time, individually wrap them, even freeze them. I'm making a giant sub. This is great for prepping ahead or feeding a crowd. Mayo is a classic, but there's so much you can do with sauces and spreads. The key is more is more. Who got the meats? The sandwich does. But don't just lay your meat flat, fold it for extra texture. A combination of two or three will tickle your taste buds. When it comes to cheese, a little goes a long way, so stick to one type. For some crunch, you can add spinach, romaine, even arugula, but I'm sticking with a sandwich shop classic, shredded iceberg. My salted tomatoes have been sitting on some paper towels to absorb extra moisture. Now I love the extra bite that onion adds and I just do it with a vegetable peeler. A little grind for a grinder. Dried herbs or a little extra spice work too. Oil and vinegars are a classic, but I have a little twist. Instead of vinegar, I use the juice from peppers or pickles. Top it off with a drizzle. The skies over flavor municipality. You don't need to be an expert or an artist to make a jack-o'-lantern masterpiece. There's that long-standing tradition to remove the top, but there's a better way starting at the bottom. I like to invert the pumpkin over a large bowl to protect the stem. Make sure everything's sturdy and stable. We're gonna be carving after all. The perfect tool for removing larger pieces is a serrated knife or a keyhole saw. You can do this freehand or trace a circle. I like to trace a shape, it just gives me more guidance. 
A tooth blade like this makes it easy to get through that thick flesh. A trusty metal spoon, one with a sharper edge, is gonna help you scrape out those insides. Using a hand mixer is becoming a popular tool for mixing up those insides. Just be gentle not to scrape away too much of the inside. Once you pick a side of the pumpkin where your carving will go, I like to thin out a little bit more of the wall from the inside. That means you'll have less to get through when you're carving. I like to use a dry erase marker to create my design. If you make a mistake or change your mind, you can quickly erase it. If you've never used these before, a set of pottery tools can be perfect for carving pumpkins. You don't have to be a pottery pro, just experiment. Pumpkins do look so much better with the stem intact and you can set it right over your light. My rule for any kitchen tool is it's gotta be used for more than just one thing. Even if you're not an egg fan, this slicer can be used for other food items. Works great for slicing mushrooms. After you get your slice, you can rotate your mushroom to get more of a dice or julienne. But little matchsticks of your mushrooms. Any food that's soft enough and small, like a strawberry, works too. You can stay. You can find a bunch of specialty tools for slicing and dicing avocados, but if you have a wire rack, you can use that. With the skin on, we'll just press it through. What I found helps here is to slide it through. Cleanup's really easy. You can quickly rinse it off, or I even throw mine in the dishwasher. In my kitchen, I tend to stay away from tools that just have one purpose, like a citrus juicer. You can achieve the same juicing action just by squeezing with a pair of tongs. For extra leverage, place that citrus near the middle and a firm squeeze. And when it comes to lemons, I like to squeeze them right side up to avoid those seeds. Your slicer can be a great go-to for herbs. I'm working with cilantro, but this works great on parsley, basil, just about anything. Most of the times you're mashing guacamole with a fork, but if you're dealing with a big batch, reach for that potato masher. The internet is full of tricks to seal snack bags without the need of a clip. This is one of the more silly ones, so let's give it a try. Cut a V, and then the tip says to tie these two ends together. I'm impressed, this worked way better than I thought. The most practical way is to use one of many different viral folding techniques to seal the chip bag. Get all the air out of the bag and you're gonna wanna fold a triangle. Then fold the opposite direction. This will create a little flap that you'll tuck under. Do the same thing on the other side. Just like that, you've got a tight seal. Nothing's coming out of there. Foil, parchment, and plastic wrap are helpful in the kitchen, but are you using them correctly? First off, this can happen. The tube comes out. The fix is already built into the box. It's right here. All you do is push this tab in. By doing this on both sides, this locks the roll in place. Instead of doing this, do this instead. Tuck the lip inside. This will get you a cleaner cut every time. And if dealing with plastic wrap is a hassle, try this. Plastic wrap in the freezer is actually a little easier to handle. It's less sticky. So much easier to handle. A sheet pan is gonna change your life when it comes to preparing meals. Here's an easy way to make three separate meals all at one time. The first step is you're gonna need some foil. For this, I'm gonna need three separate pieces. I'm gonna fold these edges together to create three sections. One sheet pan is now three. Now, just separate the chicken. You can do this with beef, shrimp, vegetables, whatever you want. I'm doing this because for my weekly meal prep, I want three different flavors. It's all the same ingredient, all the same size, so it'll cook evenly all at once. A meal prep shortcut is having the grocery store help you out with pre-cut ingredients. Frozen vegetables are also another huge time saver. The divider method works great, but alternatively, you can keep your ingredients plain and simple and mix up the flavors by topping them with different sauces. I prepped all the same ingredients, but can have some variety with different flavors throughout the week. And just like that, lunch and dinner for the whole week. Best part about this method is easy cleanup. Classic vent covers like this can yellow over time, which oddly enough is caused by sunlight exposure. After removing these, you'll just wanna give them a wipe down to get them clean. Clean off any dust stuck in those grates. You can even rinse it off in the sink. Simple way to get these white again is hydrogen peroxide. You want a container big enough to fit your grates in. Submerge it in hydrogen peroxide. Just let this sit out in the sun for a few hours covered. The big reveal, this went from a dingy yellow to pure white once again. That's amazing. Give this a quick rinse and let it dry and you can replace it back where it came from. Cleaning graters like these can be a pain. With a used lemon half and a touch of soap, you have the perfect cleaning buddy. And with a quick rinse, all that just washes right away. 
When the temperatures drop outside, you should know how to build a fire. Any campfire requires three components, tender, kindling, and fuel logs. Always check local regulations before lighting any fire. To start, you'll need a clear, dry area. Lay down two large fuel logs. Layer two more perpendicular logs. These logs will be the longest burning fuel for your fire. In the center, lay in some kindling, leaving room for airflow. Add in some tender with the kindling. Add another layer of smaller fuel logs right on top. Finish off with a little more tender on top. For a safe fire, you want an enclosed space like a fire pit or a fire ring. Now let's get this thing lit. If you start a fire, you should be the one to put it out. To do it safely, douse with water and smother until those embers are no longer warm to the touch. If you have a box that seems a little too big for the amount of paper you have, here's how to wrap and still make it fit. The key to this technique is wrapping at an angle. Make sure the paper covers all four corners. Tape one of those edges down. Next, on one side, you're gonna fold up the edge. You want a clean vertical line. Secure that with a piece of tape. Same thing on the other side. You want a straight line all the way up the edge. Lock that down with another piece of tape. Now finish up by doing the same thing on the last side. Once you have both sides done, they should come straight up and we can tape down our final piece. Because all the tape's at the bottom, you'll have clean sides all around the box. When the temperatures drop, I go for my crock pot chili recipe to warm me up. Of course you could go pre-made, but I like to make my own. It's more comforting and satisfying. I'm starting with ground beef, but of course you can use any ground meat you like. For my recipe, I just dump it in. No need to cook it all before. You can use tomato sauce, diced tomatoes, but I like crushed tomatoes. And number two. I'm using a lot of garlic, onions, celery, and peppers. So there's a debate, beans or no beans? This chili's getting beans, two types actually. Give those a quick rinse. And since these are canned beans, I'm actually gonna add them in later. Now we just need to add our spices, but I have a little trick to bring out the most flavor. In a dry skillet, I'm gonna toast my spices over some low heat, just until you can smell their aromas. Adding in our spices. My chili is full of secrets, like a splash of beer to round out the flavors. Now's the time to salt, pepper, and a bay leaf for good measure. I'm just gonna let this cook and give it a stir every once in a while. After the chili's cooked through, add the rinsed canned beans and let them cook for 30 minutes. My favorite thing about chili is the infinite topping options. If you're looking for something hearty for dinner, nothing beats a casserole. We're using frozen foods to make a hot dish. Our casserole is gonna start with a layer of taters. One layer to cover the bottom. Instead of browning ground meat, my secret shortcut is these mini meatballs. Everything needs to be arranged in one layer. Add your favorite frozen vegetables. Now it's time to sauce this. Of course you could use canned cream of mushroom, but I'm a little extra, so I'm making my own. Some heavy cream, a little touch of beef broth, Fresh mushrooms are great, but I'm using dried. These last longer on the shelf and they won't water down your sauce. Season with salt, pepper, and garlic. If you don't want dairy or mushrooms, you can use a tomato-based sauce instead. Make sure that's spread evenly around. Top that off with more taters. Now for the hot part of this dish. Once everything is cooked through, remove the foil so we can crisp up the top. Crispy top, I'm ready to dake in. After this meal, I'm gonna be ready to hibernate. When it comes to cooking, sometimes you can add a little too much salt. But with a potato, we can fix that. I'm gonna get this peeled. You don't need a big potato. Just a little medium sized one will do the job. Now this goes right into that hot pot. Let this cook until it's tender. That potato is going to absorb extra salt and liquid. This potato trick is ideal for anything liquidy like soups and stews. Once that potato is tender, you can remove it. You can also replace the lost liquid. That'll help dilute the salt as well. Mmm, mmm. Ice keeps your brew cold, but dilutes the flavor. Here's how to keep your coffee cold and add the flavor. Use your favorite creamer and your favorite ice cube tray. I'm just going to fill up those cubes with my creamer. Now this goes right in the freezer. 
This is a great way to extend the life of your creamer, especially if you buy in bulk. With these ice cubes, today was a good day. You usually keep floss in your bathroom drawer, but why not keep some in your kitchen drawer? Here's how to cut with floss. Cutting a cake with a knife and all that frosting gets really messy. And mini blades aren't long enough for one clean cut. So I'm gonna set that knife aside and floss it. And it's best to use unflavored. Start with a piece long enough to go across your cake. Wrap around your finger just like you are flossing your teeth. One clean cut all the way through. And to avoid any mess, slide it on out. Look at those edges, so clean. Now you can tell your dentist you floss before and after dessert.